This is a daunting, daunting spot to be. I do want to thank the Dean. I do want to thank uh, Andrew and, uh, for, their, for their wonderful invitation, for all their wonderful work. You are very fortunate having them leading this dynamic center uh, in real estate. But of course, these times in real estate are, uh, sort of good word, dynamic. In transition is a neutral word. Uh, and the big question is, is it distress? Is it distress again? And that's my topic. So, um, <clears throat> has housing hit bottom? I have an answer. I have a two-handed economist. Most economists don't have answers. I'll give you a, perhaps a number, but not a number with a date. A date and a number is, of course, putting those two together and you could hold them to fire. I will, in fact, uh, give you an answer. Uh, but I'm also giving you some reasons why I'm coming to the answer so that you can separately judge where we are, where we're going, because it's not certain. So first of all, some background. How did we get here? Just to remember, remind ourselves, this really started in March 2007. There were some of us, including myself, in 2006, which were saying, this is a bubble that is going to burst. This is a housing market that is going to sink. The world took notice in the beginning of 2007 of a sinking housing market. But where was it going to go? Is it just a sinking housing market? It became clear that no, it wasn't. It's rough out here. By the following January, a year later, the storms had gone beyond housing to the overall market. And six months later, we were in the maelstrom of destruction. What was next, of course, was Lehman and the collapse of the financial system. So where are we now? We're still in a sunk housing market. Housing prices are sufficiently low that 25% of mortgages out there are below their uh, value of the homes. They're underwater. The question is, where to next? Will forced sales through foreclosures sink the housing market further? Will the recent foreclosure crisis, disclosure documentation crisis, in fact halt the slide? Have housing prices from a fundamental perspective hit bottom? Or will the shadow supply through the foreclosures yet to come threaten the housing and overall recovery? Again, some perspective. This is not a national housing price decline, not a national crisis in housing markets. It is very much a regional. If you go across the country, the boom and bust is centered in the coast and uh, some of the inland states with housing supplies in elastic, the sand states, the so-called sand states, where it's extremely difficult to develop. <clears throat> that said, and there's where prices are falling, and half fallen the most. So for example, uh, in, uh, Cal in California, that's a 32% decline. 45% decline. In some parts of, uh, of Nevada, Las Vegas, we have over 50% decline. Mm -hmm. Florida, 30% decline. But there's actually a swath in the middle part of the country where prices have been stable, including Texas. Nonetheless, overall in the United States, housing prices have fallen 30%. And it is a national event because the banking system is exposed to the nation as a whole. And it's the banking system that was at risk and is at risk still today. Where did this risk come from? The risk came from a chronic imbalance that took time to build and then in fact build at a very rapid pace to the point where the system could no longer be sustainable. Where was this chronic imbalance? There's a chronic imbalance in leverage and debt. The chronic imbalance in debt and leverage and see here is not from government. Now we have a problem of a fiscal crisis and extraordinary government debt. But from 1975 to 2005, government debt as a percentage of GNP was constant. The increase in debt was not a federal phenomenon or local or state. And if you go to the non-financial corporate sector, there too, debt did not build up relative to GDP. Where was the debt increase 
the historic debt increase from 75 to 2005. It was the household sector, and in addition, the financial sector, which was lending to the housing sector, and on top of those loans, leveraged yet again. And in the financials, in the household sector, the debt expansion was entirely in mortgages. <clears throat> so where to next? The chronic imbalances are still with us. In fact, the uh, consumer uh, debt is still not worked out. And of course, now we have a problem of federal debt as well. But let's, before we go back to that bigger picture, look at some housing statistics and see what the data show. Let's go to the data. <clears throat> let's look at these indicators of where the market is. First of all, housing starts, and that's the good news, not from the perspective of a builder, obviously, not from the perspective of developers, but from the perspective of eventual recovery, we are at historic lows in starts that we haven't seen uh, since uh, the 1950s. We are at 300,000 starts, where we normally see starts over 1 million. So the starts number have plummeted. Now the other, of course, key indicator is vacancies. So with the starts plummeting, what's happened to vacancies? It would be terrific if vacancies also obviously were low. But no, that's not the case. Vacancies are high, historic highs, as you can see here, going again from the 1960s in this case, all the way to uh, current, 2010. Vacancies are at historic highs. Now let's drill down on the vacancies a little, in a little bit more detail. But by the way, you can see they look like they are stabilizing. And that's a key indicator. So let's look at the data, which is publicly available census data. Uh, and we have second quarter data, is our most recent data. So let's look at the data. And what we see here, both rental vacancy and homeowner vacancy, breaking them out, is that uh, vacancy in the rental side is, is high. By the way, uh, vacancies in commercial real estate are quite high as well, as a reflection of the overall economy. But the good news is that the vacancy in rental is stabilizing. Uh, in fact, it's been um, it's 10.6, it's 10.6 10 second quarter, and so it looks like it is stabilizing. Moving to the homeowner vacancy rate, you see two things. One, the current vacancy rate of 2.5 is far higher than the historical vacancy rate of 1.5. 1.6, 1.5, 1.7. But again, it's stabilizing. It's down from its height of 2.9. So in this year of... Um, and a year ago, two years ago, it was 2.8. So in these two years of high foreclosures, actually housing vacancy has not increased, it has stabilized. Again, <clears throat> new home sales remain at historic lows. Here we have new home sales, the blue line, again, uh, versus housing starts, the same red line we saw a moment ago. What you see in the new home sales is a blip. That blip, that uh, two double peak mountains, are exactly where what? The tax credit. So those are the tax credit, impact of the tax credit, would call, which caused demand to be brought ahead. And we are seeing the consequences of that right now, where we spent up demand and we are seeing a uh, consequent decline in demand. But if you drew a straight line through there, which I suggest you should, and in another month or two we'll be back there, we again see indicators of stability. Now foreclosures are extraordinarily high, you can see here. The foreclosure line is the red, uh, we also have 30-day uh, delinquency, etc. They're all high. But the red portion, which is foreclosure, again has stabilized over the last two years. Now I don't mean to say that this is at any point great news or even good news, but it does indicate that there is some dynamic here which is stabilizing the market. And here is the total uh, foreclosure numbers and where they're going. So this is the pipeline in a sense, the current overhang, and you see it too is stabilizing. Uh, and the key is the inventory. 
along with vacancy, I would go to, in, to inventory is key. The top red line is less uh, useful because it actually reflects, it's very, very uh, volatile, it reflects current sales, which are low due to the tax credit spending up the demand early. But go to the blue line, which is the year-to-year -year change in inventory. So the year-to-year -year change in inventory, again, shows that we are in a uh, stable, at least seemingly stabilizing position. Now let's go to the percent change in home prices. The percent change in home prices has been quite a ride, but it is stabilizing. You see that here as well. This is the putting it into price levels. Price levels were up extraordinarily on average for the U.S. as a whole. This is case shiller numbers, and now they're bouncing along the bottom. Year to date, housing prices are up using case shiller 3%. Case shiller covers the entire uh, market in their national numbers. They also focus on 20 national markets, 20 national MSAs. But this is for the national market. And you could also, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, that's the case shiller. I'm sorry, I, I'm speaking to the wrong graph. This is case shiller, where you can see it's up 3% in the um, last. Now, I'll, I'll come back to the rent price ratio in a moment. But we also have another price index, which is useful to look at. And that is the price index, which is Collect data that's collected by the Federal Housing Finance Administration, and it covers a smaller percentage of the market. This covers the non-subprime, the prime market, it's basically Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Now, it has shown, again, a bouncing along the bottom, but recently a slight decline. It is true that the high, this is not the low end. The low end is included in the case show, or it's not included here. It is true that on the higher end, we're seeing more uh, price decline. Maybe it is um, a, a, a more giving in to the fundamentals, and there was more of a hold out there previously. But that is true, that we are seeing more of a price decline currently. The price decline is about 1%, not much year to date, using this more uh, select index. But going back to here is really the key. Using case shiller and using the most general information on rents, we are at a point where rent to price ratio is back to where it was in 2002 and 2003. Uh, it's not back to where it was in the 1990s. So either you can interpret this as good news or bad news. If you think that the price to rent ratio equilibrium that we're going to go back to is the 1990s, then we still have a ways to go. If you think that the equilibrium is 2002, 2003, then we're there. Now, what does that depend on? What drives rent to price ratios? The key drive, there are two key drivers. One driver is expectations of price increases. But in 2001, 2002, uh, there wasn't a substantial expectation of price increases because, in fact, prices had not yet started their incredible run-up that really occurred after 2001, 2002. What was the other big difference in 2001, 2002 compared to the 1990s, the late 1990s? The big difference was that interest rates were lower. So I have done the calculations, and if the interest rates of 2002-2003 persisted, then in fact we are at a fundamental equilibrium. Current interest rates are lower than they were in 2002-2003 by about 200 basis points. So we still have a ways to go. And of course, if those interest rates increase, if that just happened just like that, it would be a disaster. So that is a potential disaster. But if interest rates increased with recovery slowly over time, that is not inconsistent. That is an interest rate increase that takes us back to the very low interest rates of 2001-2, but still higher than we have today. That's not inconsistent with uh, current prices. So I believe we are at a fundamental bottom, assuming interest rates do not get ahead of
growth, which I hope back to. So let's look at threats, and that will be a key threat. Threats to recovery and what to do. First of all, there is an excess housing supply. There is the inventory. And although it looks as though it's stabilizing, there is a foreclosure, it looks like we've hit a peak in the pipeline. There is a real concern for whether those foreclosed properties, the REO banks, are dumped on the market. If they were dumped on the market, that would be a return to a crisis situation. There are also policy choices. Really, they're much more limited today than they were previously. Partially because of the politics, partially because of reality. We've already done our fiscal deficit spending. Uh, we can talk more about the policy implications of that. And, of course, there is still monetary policy, and I'm going to return to that in a moment. The real key issue is negative household equity. Negative household equity that we started with is 25% of homes with mortgages underwater. Come back to that. And going back to the excess housing supply, there's not just a supply side, and we just went through those numbers of the new starts, which are historic lows, plus the foreclosure, which is the big supply, which is the big question mark. But then what's the demand side? The demand side is household formations. So I'm going to show you the numbers on that in a moment. And that's going to be key related to employment growth and the issue of confidence. So let's talk, to, talk about household formation, because that is the driver for demand for housing, household formation. Household formation is the lowest in the United States in 60 years. Six of 60 years. Where a population is several, is 100 million, 100 million more than it was 60 years ago. We're down from 1.3 million households formed per year in recent years, uh, that's a pretty steady state, <clears throat> to 350,000 households formed in recent years, last year and this year. What's happening? Where is the population growth? Babies are still being born. People are still getting married. Well, many of you may know this. Uh, people are, at young adults, are staying home. They're coming back after school. And in fact, this is absolutely tied to employment. Because as much as your young adult loves you, and you love your young adult, there would be a better option if there were employment. And also immigration has declined. So what do we do? What is this? As I say, it's job related directly. What do we do? Well, we've already had unprecedented government response and rescue efforts, which I do believe have been called for and did prevent Great Depression 2.0. So I do think we absolutely were staring in the face of a precipice. And we would have gone over without Ben Bernanke and without Congress voting for deficit spending. But that's been done. And this is a chart of the money supply. The money supply, it looks as though the vertical axis is, uh, is simply consistent with the line. No, there's actually a right line there which goes directly up the vertical axis in terms of increase in money supply. So we're so out of historical bonds, the balance. And of course, we federalize the mortgage system. And those two are related. We no longer have a private mortgage system. 90% of mortgages come with the EGLE, the government guarantee, Fannie, Freddie, and FHA. It's foreclosures relative to demand that are key to pricing. So this shows us how vulnerable we are to a spurt in foreclosures or a dumping of REO. Absolutely, price change goes with foreclosure. And the mortgage crisis is now, was, at one point, a crisis of resets, lack of affordability because of resetting mortgages. But that's not where we are now. Now we are at a combination of underwater mortgages and a job and an unemployment, lack of income to pay for mortgages. 
And it, this is not just, this is California, but it's true in, and it's not just true only in the sand states, uh, it's also true in the hard pressed Western markets like Detroit. Uh, these are a list of all the markets which are showing negative equity, starting with Nevada, which of course we just went through and showed that they also being the most hard pressed state, Arizona, Florida, third, Michigan, not a sand state, but affected by the job uh, destruction of the automobile industry, California, Georgia, which is kind of a surprise, Idaho, which surprises people. By the way, the consistency for the, for the economists in the room, the consistency of the sand states being so impacted here in a state like Idaho has to do with when the price rise occurred, it occurred because of this extraordinary increase in demand through the growth of unsustainable mortgage lending against, in some states, supply that was inelastic. So those states where supply was inelastic saw the most price rise, the highest spike in prices. State like, you don't see any, you don't see Texas here. Actually, you do see Texas here, but it's very small, and most of Texas is actually not underwater. There are parts like Boston that are. Um, and then, um, but, but almost all of the states um, <coughs> have um, some at this point, but it can be very small. So the, here is the key issue, that weak price growth obviously sustains owners' negative equity. And here is the most concerning of these slides. If home prices drop 10%, the percentage of underwater homeowners would increase by 56%. So while now we have one in four mortgage holders underwater, it would increase by 56%. And the real concern is that this would bring us back to a potential downward spiral where we were in 2009. So in 2009, we were in a situation where underwater homes were increasing the foreclosures, which was causing the percentage of sales coming through foreclosures to increase which is causing causing prices to fall, which is causing more underwater homes. So a downward spiral, which was leading to deflation, more foreclosure, more price declines, etc. And this is basically what we got out of by the massive federal intervention. And banks and servicers have sold down their REO. They are not at risk. They've built, at this very moment, they've built back their balance sheets. Banks have built back their balance sheets. They are, in fact, fiscally at this moment, not in uh, a shape that will call for the FDIC in general to increase the closing of banks. We're beyond that. But if prices spike down a, a double dip, 10%, the banking system would be in crisis again. Now it's not, and part of the reason it's not is although the number of seriously delinquent and foreclosed loans continues to grow, the REO has been sold down, and they've slowed the foreclosure and REO process, and that's the case over the last two years. So what about the foreclosure freeze? How does that play into this? And for obviously Bank of America has lifted the freeze, uh, but there's still the attorneys general who are pressing. So where that plays out, we don't know. But in any case, I believe it's temporary and does not affect the fundamentals. The only, the, the, the impact would perhaps <coughs> delay the inevitable, bend the curve, and it could stop panic. But right now we don't have panic. We don't have fire sales of ARIA. We don't have dumping into the market. And although we could possibly even see a spike positively in the short run, that would be short run. Because really what we need is job growth. It's job growth which will cause the other fundamental, which other than interest rates, which is household formation through job growth, to come back. Job growth depends on GNP growth. And GNP, GDP growth, depends on confidence. It depends on exports. It depends on the business sector. But in fact, capital expenditures are up. 
exports are up. The weakness in the overall economy is the consumer side. It's consumer sentiment, that's where we see the weakness. And in part the real issue, the question out there is, are we moving to deflation? Are we doing Japan 2.0 now? Where we had in Japan not a, de a lost decade, but two lost decades. Is that what we are about to replay? <clears throat> Japan also obviously had this, as we all know, this huge price rise in housing, and then subsequently a huge decline, which is continuing. And overall deflation. The problem with overall deflation is that households, consumers, get into a mode where it is, they are incentivized, it is rational not to spend. Because if you don't spend today, tomorrow's prices will be lower and you will be able to get more from your money tomorrow. So the savings rate has increased in Japan and there is an overall pulling back on the private spending sector and that has persisted, even though the banking sector has come back for a while, that was a major cause of the lack of growth. So what about deflation? We don't have deflation. We have zero inflation, but we don't have deflation. On the other hand, consumer sentiment is very fragile. It's not at the bottom, but it's heading back down. As I said, capital expenditures and exports are recovering. Manufacturing surveys are positive. But are we going to have a double dip or rocky recovery? I am hoping for, unfortunately, I wish I could have better sense of where we're going, a rocky recovery. <clears throat> Most indicators, I believe, signal a very weak recovery. Consumption indicators, low interest rates, which are both good but reflect a very slow recovery. And what does Ben Bernanke say? The day before yesterday, um, let me come back to what he says. Do I have that there? I thought I had his quote. Yes. He says that the FMOC will strongly resist deviations from price stability in the downward direction. Sweet. Second, the FMOC will do all that it can to ensure continuation of economic recovery and that additional purchases of longer-term securities, by that means mortgage markets, again, quantitative easing, will be effective in further easing financial conditions. In other words, we will not deflate. Bernanke wrote his PhD thesis on this, and he knows how to do it. His, his nickname has is Helicopter Ben for helicoptering money, if necessary, even years ago. So he's the right person, I believe, to be there because we cannot have deflation, and there will not be deflation. But that doesn't really solve our problem. I want to just make sure we haven't uh, skipped um, key things. Consumption is our major problem. It has not come back, and it's related to household formation, which obviously is related to consumption. Interest rates are at all-time lows. After Ben Bernanke said this, what happened to interest rates? They went up. What happened to expected inflation? It increased. Is that good news? Is that bad news? Both. It's certainly good news that we will not see deflation. It's very questionable news. Maybe it's inevitable that interest rates on the long term would go up because if inflationary expectations go up, so must long term interest rates. But it has a downside. Quantitative easing, too, has a downside. The downside is literally the devaluation of the dollar. The devaluation of the dollar, while it will increase already growing exports, and that's a good thing, also inevitably does cause consumer income to drop because it raises the cost of energy, among other imports. So this is now a very thin route to success. We must bring back jobs, stop deflation, but not in decrease the value of the dollar sufficiently to lower consumer income, and not raise interest rates 
to a point where it threatens the recovery. So the bottom line, home prices have taken a short slight dip with the tax credit and then recover, I believe, to growth, which will be in line with inflation, not this year, but going forward. I believe that between now and 2014, we could have 10% increase, but that totally depends on the inflation rate, which Ben Bernanke is aiming for, 2% inflation rate. So basically, we would see very slow to no real growth. And the, current, the, the immediate short run, three months to six months, a year out, I see very little growth. I see a very uncertain period, but I don't see a double dip. We're not out of danger, however, if we double dip. <clears throat> we federalize the system. The banking sector is still challenged, although it's out of a danger zone at this moment. If we mark to market underwater loans and indeed put the REO out there, we would have a second crisis. It's a waiting game then. And in particular, we have to at some point address Fannie and Freddie, but at this point, they are the support to the system. And the question, of course, is jobs. Now, I want to end on a happy note. <laughs> a little bit. Corporate profits are high. That's in part why the market is doing so well. Corporate profits are doing very well, thank you. And corporate profits are a leading indicator for job growth. So we could have an extraordinary burst of job growth. There is a potential, not only threats to the downside, but risk, a good risk to the upside in this forecast. We could have as much as 3 million jobs. We're down 7 million. We could have 3 million jobs a year, maybe not this year, but when recovery comes. And then recovery could, in fact, be faster than I've suggested. Thank you very much. And I'll be pleased to take questions. Not that I have answers, but. <laughs> Yes, how do you see New York recovery in comparison to the rest of the country? Uh, New York pricing, uh, this is good news, Ben, as I know it depends on where you are in the housing market. New York pricing has come back. New York rents are growing slightly. Uh, and so that's a good sign in the housing, in, in, in multifamily. Uh, I see New York, and in fact, the whole of the Mid Atlantic region, but particularly New York, being in a better position than much of the rest of, of the country, because we do do exports, actually. So I do think that we, if the overall economy grows at 1%, which GMP is growing at 1%, 1.6%, somewhere there, I think we would be uh, at that, perhaps slightly to the upside. So yes, I think we're representative of the US stronger markets. So not the strongest markets, but the stronger markets. Yes. Uh, can you give us your sense about the commercial mortgage market? Yes, the commercial mortgage market is coming back. CNBC is coming back. It's still very small, coming back slightly. CNBC at its height is 200 to 300 uh, million. It is now 20 to 30 billion, but it is coming back. Because after all, and we could, this is another bright side for those of you in, in commercial real estate, what does commercial real estate have in this market where we have such low interest rates, which I do think will persist for at least a few years, it has cash flow. So the cash flow is uh, significant and, and indeed commercial prices are in fact coming back. Uh, and that's in part while banks are, that's why banks are holding on to their commercial loans and are forbearing uh, for those uh, those buildings that are deep in debt and have debt that's rolling over, uh, there is a great deal of forbearance out there because the banks see the potential upside in the commercial real estate market, and it is there. That's not to say development, but that's to say um, uh, the lending activity is definitely coming back. Uh, acquisition is coming back. Uh, we're beginning to see some daylight and some actual deals, and so more information flows as that occurs that's going to feed into the um, uh, overall 
decrease in uncertainty in this market. Uh, Brad Case is here. Brad, one of the, the real success stories on the commercial side is REITs. And we really have a lot to thank for to have the REITs in the market because even at the, at the seizing up of the mortgage market, we really didn't understand whether CMBS, CMBS would come back. And CMBS is entirely different than RMBS. We didn't understand it. REITs were trading. They were trading every day. Susan, can you repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> and then they repriced pretty quickly, so they were part of the recovery. And now we're using REITs to get implied cap rates for the underlying real estate. So the information is flowing down. Yes, pay me, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, how are you? Um, just curious, you had mentioned in your ratio, I don't remember the exact, but you said the real estate market drops 1%, it's going to affect banking sector by 10%, whatever the ratio was. Any particular uh, banks stick out, like Bank of America, because they're heavily mortgaged out? Yes. Uh, the MBSs or Citibank, yes. any one bank in particular? No, I'm not going to name names, but the regionals <laughs> are at risk. And obviously Bank of America, that, you know, that's countrywide, so it's there. Yes. I'm just trying to think if there are any other solutions to the underwater problem that's right there. What if the government, in some form or manner, through Fannie or Freddie, decides to, um, is there any way of bailing that out? I, I saw some numbers floating, like a million mortgages times 25,000 would be 500 billion or something like that. I mean, are those kind of solutions something that might end up working where? You know, you, you, it's underwater right now. You don't want it going to fifty-six percent. A very so good question. So why not be spending so many billions anyway? A very, a very good question, and I think the answer of your question is in your question. But it, it really goes back to a point which I didn't really emphasize, and it's good to go back to it. Uh, what the real concern is that the holders of these underwater mortgages will act strategically and ruthlessly default and walk from the mortgages, even though they have the income to pay. They had some, of course, many, most of the holders of the underwater mortgages do have jobs. So the real concern is in the non-recourse states, and effectively most states are non-recourse, that borrowers will walk. And we've had episodes like that in the United States that happened in Texas in the late 1980s. But that's not happening now. If borrowers walked from, if this 25% walk, of course we would have a crisis right there. Because then the foreclosure would increase, uh, the REO, the foreclosure would increase substantially. So, it, it, and why aren't they? Why aren't they uh, acting ruthlessly? Well, only an economist would really raise that question. Because people live in their homes. And they want to stay in their homes. They have jobs, they have family. And in fact, they're hoping, expecting that prices will come back. And if they can make the mortgage, they're making the mortgage. Of course, if they cannot make the mortgage, then they cannot sell into this market, and that's a foreclosure in these homes. So back to the situation of the suggestion of, so it's a threat out there. Now, could we solve this threat? Could we, in fact, write down the principle across the board so that we don't have underwater mortgages, and then we would not have this threat? The cost would be $500 billion to perhaps as much as a trillion, depending on if, in fact, you actually had this mark to market, it could actually put downward pressure. We don't have any trillion dollars. We don't have $500 billion. Yes? Well, it's Would any uh, change in the political landscape uh, in the election midterm would have any uh, effect, effect on the uh, scenario just outlined this morning? Uh, well, I'm an economist, uh, not a political analyst. Uh, but I will share with you my concern that certainly uh, I mean, we all know that it looks like the House will, will go Republican. And that will give us some gridlock. Is that good? Is that bad? I don't know all the consequences of it. Um, but it's already there. It's already in the system. I think uh, the president uh, is already 
looking forward to the issues of the re his re-election, potentially. So I don't think there are major policy shifts coming from the current administration. Now let's turn to the what happens uh, when the House becomes Republican. Uh, and we don't know about the Senate and how much of a shift there will be there. My major concern is that the Republicans, ironically enough, may not understand from a business perspective how important Fannie and Freddie are now to the current status and current stability. I absolutely think we need to privatize the mortgage system going forward and we have to bring private capital to risk. But right now, they are the only game in town. So that I do see as a question. When I raise this with some of my Republican friends who are business people, they say, oh, no problem. Yeah, we'll be there. <laughs> you can be sure. And the multifamily folks in this room, how many of you deal with multifamily? Well, this is not a multifamily crowd, but uh, you are, uh, you know your development is occurring there. It's occurring because of Fannie and Freddie. So it is a, um, it is a potential concern. But um, you know, once you have control, you also own the problem. So my situation, my sense is that we will be. <coughs> this will be the stable view that we'll see, whatever happens. With no other questions, uh, I am sorry not to be the bringer of better news. But notice that possible job growth out there, and many of you are business people. So. Um, let's go for it. And uh, this is just a great, great group here. And I, I once again congratulate you on this real estate center and all the good work it is doing. And thank you again for inviting.